Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, what I'd like to talk with you about today is the Eiffel Tower. And uh, you can see from the subtitle, I've called it the symbol of freedom in the city of light. Uh, Paris is known as the city of light, and that's where the Eiffel Tower is. All right. Now, perhaps you might want to know, well, why do I want to learn about the Eiffel Tower? And why is Ken, my ESL teacher, who I know studied biology, why is he going to present something about the Eiffel Tower? Well, it's, it's something kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, when I was in high school, I took French class for five years. And I really loved French class. I, I, I liked the idea of being bilingual. Uh, in those days, French and German were the only languages that were offered in high school. And so I, I studied French really hard. And uh, I, I, I wanted to keep studying French. But I came to a point in my high school career where I had to make a choice between language and science. I wanted to take advanced placement courses in high school so I could get college credit and, and go on to be a doctor. Uh, and so it, it was a, a, a kind of heart-wrenching decision, but I, I had to give up French, which was unfortunate because it was, uh, it was just at the point where I was beginning to think in French. Now, you guys have been studying English for a long time. Do you think in English or do you still think in your native language? English. Yeah, right? And, and when you are able to, to think in English, that's a, a huge step to, to being bilingual. And when you begin to think in that second language, you can really improve very, very quickly. I had just gotten to that point in French when I gave it up. And uh, I, I kind of regret that. But um, also uh, related to the Eiffel Tower, it, the thing itself is beautiful. And uh, I, I want to uh, not only show you the tower, but I, I want to, to tell you about the tower because it has interesting history. Uh, also, it, it is a tourist attraction. Everybody in the world knows the Eiffel Tower. Uh, did you know that it attracts more than 1,000 uh, tourists per hour? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, it is an important symbol uh, known throughout the world, and that's why I want to talk with you about it today. All right, so uh, in this presentation, uh, I'll take you through uh, some of the building of the Eiffel Tower. And then after it was built, I'll, I'll tell you something about its, its history. Uh, I'll also mention the significance of the tower, what it means. Okay. Uh, I'll very briefly discuss how it's maintained because there, there are a couple tidbits of uh, interesting information there. And then I'll briefly describe the, the tower today. Okay? So that's where I'm going with. It. Now, uh, why, in the first place, was the tower even built? Well, uh, in 1889, uh, Paris held the, uh, the World Exposition. I don't know if you've ever heard the word expo. Yeah. Have you? Yeah. Uh, there's a baseball, there's, or there was a baseball team called the Montreal Expos, and uh, uh, Montreal had held the expo uh, uh, the year that the, that the team was made. Uh, anyway, so this exposition was held in Paris in 1889, so it's more than 100 years ago. Uh, and at that time, it was the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. Okay, so it was a significant time in uh, French history, uh, and that they wanted to do something special. Uh, there was another reason, and, and that is that... Uh, France and Germany had had a war uh, in 1870, and uh, France lost that war, 
And uh, as a result, parts of the, 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 the western parts of uh, France became German, the, the regions called Alsace and Lorraine. Uh, so the, the pride of the French was, was hurt. And so they, they wanted to build this great tower to kind of regain some of, some of their pride after that. Okay. Yeah, incidentally, this tower, the Eiffel Tower, uh, when it was built, uh, was the tallest building in the world. So you can imagine that that pride was uh, connected to that. So uh, the designer, the main architect of the, the tower was a, <coughs> excuse me, was a man named Gustave Eiffel. All right. And what's interesting about him is that he had not built buildings before. He was famous as a bridge maker. All right. Now, can you see in the design of the tower the resemblance of a bridge? Yeah, that, that, that's kind of significant. You know, this bridge maker took his uh, bridge making talent and uh, put it into building the Eiffel Tower. Did you know that before? Yeah, kind of interesting. All right. Uh, so as I said before, the Eiffel Tower was the, the highest building in the world at that time. And in fact, many of the people in Paris were afraid of the tower. They thought that a building that high just could not stand. They, they were afraid that it would fall. And I don't know if you've ever uh, done this at home. You know, if you, if you have wooden blocks and you, and you build, you know, you can only build so high and, and it just falls. And, and you know, why exactly, you don't know, but, but uh, it's just not stable enough, right? And that's sort of the way the people of Paris felt about the tower. They said, oh, it's just going to be too high. It's just going to fall on us. And there was great resistance uh, to the building of the tower. Um, but, uh, good morning. Yeah. All right. Uh, the tower was built. And uh, uh, you, can, you can see uh, from the tower, it has a, an airy and light atmosphere. And that's going to be significant, and I'll explain that significance later. So uh, I, I want to continue with the story of the, the building of the tower here. Uh, involved in the building of the tower were at least 50 engineers. <laughs> Imagine having, having 50 engineers working on, on a project. Uh, and there were more than 5,300 blueprints involved in the construction process. I don't know if you know what a blueprint is. Uh, anybody know what a blueprint is? Well, uh, a, a blueprint is an architectural design. And it's written on, it's, they're drawn on special paper that, that's blue. And, and so it's called a blueprint. All right? So it, in the designing of this tower, there were more than 5,300 blueprints made. Uh, all right. However, uh, and this might surprise you, there were fewer than 300 workers involved in the building of the tower. How do you feel about that? Does that seem a little surprising for such a big tower? Yeah. All right. Also, and then this might surprise you too, In the, in the construction of the tower, there are only three kinds of pieces. There are flat bars. A bar is something like this. You, you know what a bar is from a, a bar graph. OK? So there were flat bars. There were angle brackets. Look like this, that, that hold things together. And then there were flat plates. All 
right? There are only these three kinds of pieces in the entire tower. Uh, however, there were <laughs> more than 2.5 million rivets holding all these things together. Now, rivets, have you ever heard this word? Well, I, I, I hope this lecture is so interesting that your attention is riveted to me. Okay? Uh, do you see this picture? All these little things, these are the, the connectors. Those are rivets. And, and uh, this picture actually, I don't know if you can tell, this is the Eiffel Tower looking up uh, the side of the Eiffel Tower and you can see all these rivets uh, where the, the pieces are connected. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. So you understand what rivets are? Yeah. Great. Okay. And a riveting lecture is something that has you, uh, uh, has your complete attention. Okay? Uh, oh, by the way, let me go back here. Uh, notice again, whenever I have a, a picture, I have the source here. Okay. So uh, in the, the building of the tower, they use these standardized prefabricated material. So, so everything was, was made in other places, right? And the, they, were, they were standard sizes, and they just fit them together quickly on the site. And the building of the tower, as a result of this standardized prefabricated process, uh, it only took two years, two months, and five days. Right, so it went up rather quickly for being such a tall tower. Uh, if you wanted to compare it to, for example, the, the, the Tower of Pisa, do you know the Tower of Pisa, the, the, the leaning one? Mm -hmm. uh, that took more than 200 years. <laughs> 200 years. <laughs> so you can see that, that this, uh, this went up really fast. All right. Also remarkable in the building of the tower was there was not a single death. Uh, many of the Parisianers were afraid that you know, building this tower would, would cost many lives. Nobody died, which was wonderful. All right? Uh, and here's another little piece of interesting trivia. Uh, the Eiffel Tower actually was not originally called the Eiffel Tower. In fact, when it was first made, Nobody quite knew what to call it. They called it the 300-meter the tower because they knew it was, it was more than 300 meters. Right? It was only later that it became called the Eiffel Tower, or as they say in French, the Tour Eiffel. Okay? Now, uh, how high is the tower? Well, uh, it, it is uh, 324 meters. And if you wanted to climb up to the top, you can do it. There are 1,710 steps. I wonder if any of you would be interested in, in making that climb. Well, fortunately, there are elevators, too. <laughs> um, but uh, Eiffel himself was the first to climb all the way to the top. Uh, which was rather fitting. So the, the, the tower was built for the exposition, the World Exposition, and it was an immediate success. Uh, and for every year since it was built, uh, tourism profits have been greater than a million dollars per year. Now, think about this. You know, a million dollars in 1889, that's a lot, <laughs> all right? It far exceeds a million dollars now. Okay, now uh, one thing that, I, that I, I didn't tell you earlier is that, well, I had told you that there was resistance to the tower. Uh, you know, Paris was a city known for art, uh, known for its picturesque beauty, and the, the very sensitive 
uh, the artistically sensitive people in, in the city didn't want this big, ugly metal thing in the middle of their city. And so when the tower was built, it was uh, basically with the promise that it would be taken down in 20 years. Did you know that? Yeah, it only had a, a temporary permit. Uh, but uh, fortunately for the tower, and I believe fortunately for the entire world, radio came into existence during those 20 years. And the tower proved extremely useful as a radio tower. The radio messages could be sent from it. And uh, because of that, uh, it was allowed to stay. All right. So well, we, can, we can thank the invention of radio for the existence of the Eiffel Tower today. All right. Then it proved itself, it proved itself useful once again uh, during World War I. Uh, where it was an observation tower. Now, I, I don't know if you know much about World War I, but uh, how was World War I fought? Was it fought with, with airplanes and, and tanks? And, uh, they, they came into existence at that time, but, but that wasn't the primary way that World War I was fought. World War I was basically fought between trenches, right? One side built a long trench and its people, <laughs> not, not trees, its people <laughs> were in the trench hiding. And these people were uh, in the trench hiding. And once in a while, they would all say, up and over, and they'd run out, and the other side would shoot them down. <laughs> and then this side would say, OK, up and over, and they'd run out, and they'd be shot down. And, and the trenches didn't move. But you can imagine that if this side, whoops, I'm probably out of the, the TV. If this side has a high tower back here, can you imagine the advantage that they have? that they can see what's going on over here and, and even maybe inside the trenches. Okay? So the Eiffel Tower was... Did I make that thing? Yeah. Yeah. So the Eiffel Tower was used as, as an observation tower. Right? Now, World War II also uh, had a little bit of interesting history here. Uh, perhaps you know from World War II, uh, the French didn't put up much of a fight. Uh, and uh, Germany very, very quickly occupied French, uh, France. And uh, the, uh, Germany set up uh, a sort of French puppet government. Uh, and basically, Germany uh, ruled Paris uh, through the, the, the puppet government. All right? Now, uh, Hitler himself at one point uh, visited Paris and, and you know, Hitler in his pride wanted to go up to the, the top of the tower and, and look over and see all the, the lands that uh, his armies had conquered. Uh, but uh, before his arrival, the, the French resistance, the, the underground resistance, the secret uh, fighters who were resisting Germany, they actually sabotaged the uh, uh, elevators in the Eiffel Tower so that Hitler couldn't go up. So uh, it was said that uh, uh, Hitler conquered France, but he didn't conquer the tower. All right? <laughs> um, and then he eventually uh, the American armies uh, came through Paris and, and liberated uh, it and the tower. And uh, that was the Eiffel Tower in World War II. But there's still more interesting history uh, related to uh, the tower. 
And uh, this is Gustave Eiffel himself. All right. Uh, you can imagine that with the building of the tower, um, that uh, Gustave Eiffel was a, was a fairly famous and popular person, although there were many who resisted the tower. Uh, you know, it, the tower was a great success at the, at the expo, and, and he was respected. As you know, originally the tower wasn't named after him, so he had enough respect uh, that the tower was named after him. But uh, at that time, France wanted to build the Panama Canal. Okay, you know what the Panama Canal is, right? Everybody good with that? It, it hasn't always been there. <laughs> All right? And in the, in the late 1800s, uh, France wanted to, to, to build the canal through Panama. Uh, but they tried, and they tried, and they tried. And it was a very, very difficult project because Panama is in a tropical area where it rains like it did yesterday here, year round. It's just always wet, always soggy, and you can imagine you know, trying to build in this mud, and you move the mud, and the mud slides back, and you move in the mud, and the mud slides back. It, it was very difficult to do. Uh, additionally, I think you might remember from our uh, presentation on the Transcontinental Railroad, do you remember when people wanted to go through Panama, the danger that they faced? What, what was the danger that they faced? What? Death. Yeah, death. Okay, why? What, what, what would they die of? Bzzz. Bugs. Yeah, yeah. Mosquitoes. Yeah. And what did they... Was it the, disease. Yes, the mosquitoes spread disease. Yellow fever and uh, uh, various other things. Uh, you know, so many of the, the French people working there died. So this uh, building of the, of the canal was a great failure. But before people knew that it was going to fail, uh, Gustave Eiffel was uh, going around Fran France raising funds, raising funds for the building of the canal, raising funds for the building of the canal. And, and he brought in a lot of money. And the canal was never built. So you can imagine that uh, there were many who were angry at him, uh, accusing him of basically just taking their money and using it for himself. Uh, and, and that's a crime called profiteering. In fact, uh, he was brought to court, stood trial, and he was convicted of profiteering. He was found guilty. Um, now, happily for him, later that conviction was overturned. Uh, but uh, uh, you can imagine that, that he was rather distraught. He was frustrated with, with engineering and uh, building. Uh, and so he actually left construction. He stopped. He gave up his career for aeronautics. You know what aeronautics is? Aeronautics is the study of flight. At that time, airplanes were, were beginning to uh, become common. And uh, he became an aeronautics engineer. And he actually built a flight testing center uh, that's still used today. Okay, so what do you think? Is, is that some, some interesting historical facts related to the tower? Stuff that you hadn't known before? Does it make the tower come to life just a little bit for you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all right. Uh, but now I, I want to explain uh, not so much the historical significance, but uh, uh, other aspects of, this, of the significance of the tower. And the first I want to talk about is the artistic 
significance. All right? Now, when you, when you look at the tower, especially when you, when you see it in this, in this picture, uh, do you feel the impression of, of lightness? Does it, does it look like a heavy tower? No. no. no in fact, it is extremely heavy, but it doesn't appear heavy. Okay, it appears light and airy, uh, which was uh, unique, especially for its time. Okay? And with the yellow uh, illumination, it, uh, well, y you probably know from, from art, what is associated with yellow? What feelings are associated with yellow? Warmth. Warmth. What else? Maybe cheer, right? Yeah. Happiness, yes? Okay. So this tower achieves that effect. Uh, and related to that is the philosophical significance of the tower. Um, I don't know if, if you have ever heard of existentialism. Well, you, you've heard of existence, yeah. right? W what is existence? Being. Yeah, it's just being, all right? And uh, basically, at the time that the tower was built, and, and even today, uh, there was a, a, a swing in philosophy uh, away from, what do I want to say, R religion that, that has joy and it has afterlife and it has um, uh, not just our existence. It has things beyond our existence. But at that time there was a swing toward this uh, existentialism that says, we are here and that's all. And related to that, you can hear things like, uh, you know, we, we, we're born, we go to school, we work, we die. Is there a lot of joy associated with that? N not very much, right? But you can see that this tower stands kind of in contrast to that feeling, that, that heavy existential feeling is, is made lighter by this tower. Do you see it? Do you feel it? All right. So that, that uh, philosophical impact uh, probably can't be understated. Uh, right? Also, uh, th there was a technological significance to the tower in that, uh, as I told you, Whoop, I erased them. The, the pieces of the tower were all very simple. They all basically looked the same. Three different kinds of pieces, they all looked the same. They were modest. Not, nothing was spectacular. But they were unified and they were interlocked. And by unifying these simple, basic pieces, this great tower emerged. Okay? Uh, so basically what I have here is that unified, modest, interlocking elements can yield greatness. And uh, actually you can understand something philosophical there too, can't you? That the we are all simple if we stand together, if we unite, we can do great things. Okay? Finally, uh, there is the economic significance, which I hinted at earlier, uh, with tourism, uh, you know, a hundred, I'm uh, sorry, a thousand tourists per hour and more than a million dollars per year from the beginning. Uh, it was designed for tourism, and it's been extremely successful at it. It still is a major attraction. Okay? Now, uh, as I told you, I'll, I'll take you a little bit through the maintenance of the tower. Now, maintenance seems to be a kind of boring, humdrum, you know, sweeping sort of, sort of thing. But uh, uh, you can imagine that uh, with, with the, the elevators, the elevator technology has changed 
uh, over the last 150 years. Uh, so the, the elevators have had to be renewed many times. Um, but this is the, the most interesting aspect. The Eiffel Tower, the, the entire tower is repainted every seven years. But it's not like they paint the tower overnight and then they wait seven years. It's, it's too big to do that. Basically, the tower is continuously being repainted. It takes seven years to repaint the tower, and then they just start all over again. <laughs> oh. Kind of interesting, right? Have you ever thought, you know, how, how do they repaint a tower like that? Right. Oh. And it takes 50 tons of paint. Uh, to, to cover the tower. Now, uh, what's the tower like today? I wonder if any of you have been to I think, Adel, you said maybe you, you had been there. Yeah. Did you go to the tower? Did you go up in the tower? No. No? Okay, okay. Well, uh, as I told you, it gets more than 1,000 tourists per hour. Uh, but the workers at the tower take great pride in it. They, they are proud to be the symbol of Paris. Uh, there is a four-star restaurant on the third tier, which would be, which would be, okay, one, two, three, here. Okay. There's a four-star restaurant called the, Jew, the Jules Verne restaurant there. Uh, per perhaps you have heard that uh, French, French cooking is called high cuisine. Yeah. Well, th this is literally high cuisine. <laughs> All right. Um, and do you know who Jules Verne is? Chef. Not a chef. Good try, though. Jules Verne is a famous French author. Yeah, he, he wrote uh, Around the World in 80 Days and uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're thinking in Chinese. What was the title in Chinese, right? Yeah, <laughs> I can see it going on in your mind. All right, yeah. Okay, so more. Um, if you happen to go to the tower, uh, Basically, what you would do is you would get to the bottom, and there's, a, there's an elevator in each of the four legs. And these elevators go up at 60-degree at angles. It's kind of an unusual elevator, right? Usually you think of this, right? These elevators go up like that. Uh, and then, from the third tier, uh, there are uh, more elevators that, that you can uh, take up vertically. All right. Or, if you want, you can challenge yourself and take the stairs. <laughs> All right. uh, th there is one unhappy uh, aspect of the tower, and that is that there, uh, there are three to four suicides each year, uh, where you know, people go up to the tower and they jump. Uh, so the workers there have to be constantly uh, on the alert. They, they want to prevent people from jumping. All right. So, uh, to conclude, and uh, you noticed in this presentation that, that I, I, I had an overview, that I had a reasons uh, slide, and I uh, have a conclusion here to wrap things up. Uh, the tower was designed for tourism. And it was immediately successful. It has been successful throughout its history. It was the first building in the world over 300 meters. And it didn't fall. <laughs> right. uh, you've seen some of the uh, interesting uh, stories related to its history and, uh, and even its builders, its designers' history, I fell. 
And uh, you know, I personally hope someday to be able to see it, and I hope that maybe, maybe if you go to see it, that because you heard this presentation, you'll enjoy it more. You, you know more about it. Okay? So, um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. That is not all. I have one other thing. <laughs> did, did you turn it off? Okay. All right. How could I forget? References. All right. Uh, and you remember uh, how many references are you supposed to have? At least three that are not Wikipedia, right? And there we have them. And Harry, how does it look? Does it, does it look right? Yeah. Okay. Notice the alphabetical order. All right. And notice the hang indent and all that. Okay. So now we are finished, and, and I want to thank you all.